I have from last week mentioned that the theme of the book of Daniel is God's sovereignty over the world, over world history. I just want to mention two things and then we're going to move on. First of all, the book is divided into two sections. You have a historical section and you have a prophetical <coughs> section. The historical section is written in Hebrew, I'm sorry, in Aramaic. The prophetic section is written in Aramaic. We're about to come to Daniel chapter 8, and so I need to lay a little bit of groundwork. Daniel 2 told us there are four world empires that are going to affect Israel. Remember, that's the key to the whole book. Everything in the book is about Israel and how they are affected. Those four kingdoms were Babylon, chapter 2, with a head of gold. Chapter 7, it is the lion with wings. And then Persia, the Persian Empire, silver, the chest of silver, and then the uh, bear, and then thirdly, Greece. That was the abdomen of bronze, and that is the leopard with wings. And finally, Rome. In Daniel chapter 8, you have a battle between two empires. Those two empires are the ram and the goat, if you'll notice. So let's take our Bible, and I want to read Daniel 8, verses 1 through 6. And then Daniel 8, verse 20. So, Daniel chapter 8. Notice, if you would please, in Daniel chapter number 8. And I'll begin reading at verse 1. And then we'll jump to verse 20 because there's an explanation there. Daniel chapter 8, beginning at verse number 1. Notice, if you would please. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. Now, let me just stop and just remind you. We are 50 years after Daniel came to Babylon. You have Daniel has visions, or the king has visions. Daniel interprets them in the beginning. That's at the beginning of the reign. And then the book is silent. Now we come clear down 50 years later. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time, which was Daniel chapter 7. I saw in the vision, and it happened while I was looking, that I was in Shushan, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. I saw in the vision that I was by the river Uli. Now, all of this detail, simply in your mind, you are going to the base of the Tigris-Euphrates River. You're almost to Kuwait. Think in terms of that. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and there, standing by, beside the river, was a ram, which had two horns. That's not the surprise. But notice, and the two horns were high, high in the sense of power. But one horn was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand. But he did according to his will, and became great. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west, across the surface of the whole earth, without touching the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram, and he moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore the male goat grew very great 
And I'm going to ask you to drop down to verse 20 now because I want to talk about this. In verse number 20, the Bible says, The ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of, and I want you to notice, he names the empires, Media and Persia. Go back, if you will, to verse 3. In verse 3, notice at the end of verse 3, but one horn was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. Let me give you a little bit of history. The kingdom of Media, from which Darius in the book of Daniel came when they conquered the city of Babylon. The kingdom of Media existed as a powerful kingdom, and Persia grew in power, so the Medo-Persian empires we know it in history came to be known as the Persian Empire. And then notice, if you will, please, verse 21. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king, and the first king is Alexander. So we come to Daniel 8. And we're about to read of this struggle. So I'm going to ask you if you would notice the screen. This is going to move rather uh, quickly. And you don't need to take all this down. Don't even try to take it down. You'll never be able to. I'm going to give each of you the PowerPoint by email. <clears throat> First of all, you have the four world empires. What do they all have in common? Number one, each empire diminishes in power, meaning centralization of power. In Babylon, you had basically an autocrat or a dictator. In Persia, pardon me, you had an oligarchy where you had the law of the Medes and the Persians together. In Greece, you had generals. In Rome, you had a republic with a senate. Each beast, each of those world empires, higher, stands in opposition to the nation of Israel. Babylonia defeated Israel for the first time in 605 B.C. Medo-Persia, remember the book of Esther, and there was a movement by Haman to annihilate all the Jews in the entire Persian Empire. Then thirdly, Greece, in the kingdom of Greece, one of the kings, Antiochus Epiphanes, tried to destroy the nation of Israel, and you had the famous Hanukkah celebration coming out of that. And of course, Rome ruthlessly ruled Israel. Each empire had a type of the Antichrist. Who is the Antichrist in the book of, uh, in the book of uh, Daniel chapter 4 in the history of Babylon? King Nebuchadnezzar himself. Three times he attacked the city of Jerusalem, finally destroying it. In Persia, it is Haman. In Greece, it is Antiochus Epiphanes. In Rome, most notably, Domitian, the emperor who brought about emperor worship. Each of the kingdoms affected the temple. In Babylon, Daniel chapter number one, you have the king taking off, remember, the gold and silver vessels. In Persia, you have the decision made for Israel to be annihilated and yet Cyrus allows the Jews to return. In Greece, Antiochus Epiphanes had his, Jew, his troops kill a pig on the altar. And finally, in Rome, under Titus's leadership, they leveled the temple. But let me say this. Rome did not destroy the temple. It's commonly assumed that the government did. But let me remind you, when Rome came against Israel in the Roman Empire, you had five of the major legions of Rome. All of the five major legions came from Greece and moved all the way into Syria, Saudi Arabia, and all the way to Persia. They were all Eastern armies. Titus did not give the command to destroy the temple. If you read the writings of Josephus, Josephus says that Titus was stunned that his men had destroyed the temple as the fire was actually raging. So the 
as the history records it, the kingdoms of the east destroyed the temple. That's an important fact of history, and it will come up again today. Now you have Daniel chapter 8, the ram and the he-goat. So, I draw your attention once again, and I'm going to walk through this chapter with you. So if you have your Bible, you may want to underline some things. In verse 20 of Daniel 8, you have the two major kingdoms identified. There, verse 20, the kings of Media and Persia. And in verse number 21, the kingdom of Greece. Now, the moment I say Media and Persia, and the moment I say Greece, your minds run to the two ends of their empires. I have some maps that I'm about to show you, and you may be surprised at the overlap. <clears throat> Coming to verse 2, I saw in the vision, and so it happened while I was in. And I want you to notice all the geographical uh, elements in this verse. Shushan, the citadel, the province of Eli, uh, Elam, and then the river Uli. Why are all four of them important? If you will simply pick up and go back and look at the battle that was fought when Saddam Hussein's soldiers fled Kuwait, it was almost exactly where this took place. It's a very interesting, interesting coincidence. Okay? Verse 3, I lifted my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river, ah, it looks like this whole thing is right around the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley. There, standing beside the river, was a ram, which had two horns, and the two horns were high, and the one was higher than the other, and the higher <coughs> came up, one came up last. Let me just say this. Historians have rejected the book of Daniel because Daniel, in Daniel chapter number 5 and chapter 6, tells us that um, Darius led the armies to defeat the city of uh, Babylon. But Darius is not known anywhere in Persian history, but he is known in the history of Media. He was the leader of the Medes. And the Medes, if you carefully read Daniel 5, were the ones who led the advance on the city of Babylon. Verse 4. I saw a ram, or the ram, pushing westward, northward, and southward. Well, if it's pushing west, it's pushing north, it's pushing south, it's from the east. That's common sense. So, I'll show you that on the screen in just a minute. So that, and notice these three very important statements of that empire. No animal could withstand him, nor was there any who secondly could deliver from his hands, and thirdly he did according to his will and became great. So I want you to look at the map. When you look at the map, you see the Persian Empire. And the Persian Empire began on the far left on the screen uh, that is in front of you. The Persian Empire moved north, and if you would look at a modern map today, at the southern end of Russia, you have all of the stands, Kazakhstan, Kajikistan, uh, Tajikistan, uh, um, Azerbaijan, all of these kingdoms are to the north of Iran. On the map, they would be if you look closely at the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, they would be that area north. And so you have this empire moving first, and it moves to the north, to the south, to the west. How far south Persia, if you notice on the map, at one point ruled part of Egypt. A second map, just to reaffirm this, this was the extent of their kingdom, and they actually were able to go all the way into Greece. And so, I just want you to be aware of that. Notice verse 5, if you would. Verse 5, the Bible tells us that Daniel says, As I was considering, 
Suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth, meaning the inhabited populations of the world, because the world population centered in this part of the earth. But then it makes this statement, without touching the ground. Can I ask you a question? Did the feet and horses of Alexander not touch the ground? Logic would say that they would touch the ground. But that's not what this says. <clears throat> I mean, how, how else would they advance if they... But the text can't be wrong. So what is it talking about? Super, oh, supernatural. See, this is where <coughs> people who interpret this chapter only as history, they ignore certain phrases. And I'm drawing your attention to it. So please take note in your Bible that they did not touch the ground. The only way that could happen is you have what we call aerial warfare. And there was no aerial warfare at that time. So is this all only history? Or does history repeat itself and maybe something will go on besides Alexander's conquest. That's the first thing that ought to tip us off, that what you have in prophecy is you have a prophet looking at the vision, and the prophet sees the top of the mountains, but he does not see the valley. All he can see is the peaks. And this often happens in history. Antiochus Epiphanes was an example of seeing someone who looks like the Antichrist, but he is not the Antichrist himself. So, let me take a few moments and develop this idea of Alexander and his conquest. He conquered the world in just 12 years. It only took him from 323 to 333, uh, 334 to conquer the entire world, and he never lost one battle. Here's another interesting fact of history. Nebuchadnezzar besieged the city of Tyre on the coast of Lebanon for 13 years and was never able to reduce it. Alexander the Great not only reduced it, but he burned it to, ground, to the ground. That's the difference in the two militaries. Now, let's talk about Alexander for a moment. Alexander did not come from the east. He came from the west. So if you'll notice, he would come from the left side of the screen and he would move in the direction of the right side of the screen. But let me surprise you. Do you realize if I take a map and I lay the kingdom of Alexander and the kingdom of Persia on top of each other, they are the same territory. That is an important fact. We're dealing with an area of the world and that's what the Bible is focusing on. Not so much what you know in history, but that territory becomes critical because from this point on in the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel is about to develop for us from Daniel 7 all the way to Daniel chapter 12 that the world's battle for the nation of Israel will be focused just on this territory that you're seeing in yellow on this map. In other words, from Greece, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and then moving into southern, uh, to the south, Egypt, the Gaza Peninsula as you know it. Now, notice, as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west, across the surface of the whole earth, the inhabited world, in other words, worldwide power, without touching the ground, the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Let me stop and just point out to you. You'll notice that you have written here the Battle of Gog Gamela. That was the final defeat when Alexander defeated the Persian army. On the map, you have four stars if you look at them. Far left, you have two in Greece, and then coming into Asia Minor, <coughs> the Battle of Sussex, and then ultimately the defeat of the Persians at this final 
battle site that is mentioned. The Bible clearly is saying that the story of Alexander is putting the Persians at bay. Alexander defeated the Persians three times and notice the numbers. This is absolutely unbelievable. 30,000 Greek forces against 800,000 Persians. What was the difference? Remember, brass. Persia did not have bronze shields, swords to protect themselves. Alexander was wounded in 326 BC, and then he became an alcoholic, and that continued to grow until he finally died. Verse 6, again, just picking up the story, because this is going to be developing. History will repeat itself. The Bible says, then he came to the ram that had two horns, meaning that Alexander faced the ram, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram. So note two things. He broke his two horns, meaning he broke the kingdom of Media and the kingdom of Persia, and absolutely no military power is left in Persia. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. What happened in history? Alexander's wife and son were murdered, so he left no heir to the kingdom. When he died, notice on the screen, 20 years of civil war took place between the Greek generals, and they finally divided the kingdom into four sub-kingdoms. Now, I'm going to talk about prophecy, because up to this point, all I've talked about is history. Harry Rimmer was a great preacher of the gospel and a premillennialist, and Harry Rimmer in his book on prophecy, said the following. He said, we are not prophets. We are students of prophecy. We are not called to prophesy. Our task is to study the prophecies. What does that mean? That means that we don't have any insight into what world empire is going to actually rule. We don't. We are not called upon to actually give the answer. So in order to understand the last days, we have to go back and look at the scripture because that is our only authority and we are at best attempting to read tea leaves. And if we approach this that way, we'll begin to gain a better understanding of prophecy. So turn to Daniel 8 and I want you to look at verses 10 through 12. We're about to discover a problem in how we interpret this passage. Daniel 8, notice verse 10. Daniel 8, verse 10. The Bible tells us concerning the he goat, that, I'm sorry, concerning, yes, the he goat. The Bible says, and it grew up to, would you notice those next words? Underline them in your Bible. The host of heaven. What is the host of heaven? I'll give you a hint. Why don't you consider the angelic world? Yes. And notice, it casts down some of the host. Wait a minute. Would you note that? Cast down? And some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. I'm going to ask you some questions. The Greek Empire that defeated the Persian Empire. Did Alexander the Great ever affect the hosts of heaven, the stars of heaven, defeat them and trample them? No. Oh. Well, we often hear people say that the 
perfect example of the Antichrist was Antiochus Epiphanes, who was actually a part of the Greek Empire. So my question is, did Antiochus cause the angels in heaven to fall? No. Take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Revelation. Hold your place in Daniel. Revelation. <clears throat> I would remind you of these words that John wrote. Revelation chapter number 12. And notice, if you will, please, Revelation 12. The Bible says, beginning in verse number 1, just to lay the groundwork. The Bible says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. The woman is Israel. The twelve stars are the twelve tribes. So this whole chapter that I'm about to read is the persecution of the Jews, and it occurs during the tribulation, though we've seen it all through history. But it reaches its climax under the Antichrist. Now listen carefully that being with child, she cried out in birth, and in pain gave birth. Yes, Jesus Christ came from Israel, but the Jewish nation came back to being in 1948. And all of a sudden, the nation of Israel is the center of the world's big battles. Notice verse 3. You have another sign. Behold, a great fiery, great fiery red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his horns. That is Satan. Satan, and notice, if you will, verse 4. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. This is a heavenly battle that will take place when the demonic beings of the world and the angelic beings of the world are drawn in in the last tribulation in the book of Daniel. So, question, is Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, pardon me, is it only history? Or is it something that took place in history and now you have something that is a future event and history gives us insight to the future event? Turn back to the book of Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. I have to ask this question. Do we, and I don't know how I got double E there. <laughs> That's the first mistake I've made since the last one. Do we interpret only half the vision and ignore the end time fulfillment? Say, this is an end time vision? It is, and I'm about to show you that. I want to mention a book that I would encourage you to pick up on this chapter. It is a study of Daniel 8, and it is the best study I've ever read <coughs> on Daniel 8. The book is entitled, Daniel Revisited. Remember, you will get this in, in the PowerPoint that I'll send. It is Daniel Revisited by Mark Davidson. Now, why is the Mideast such a critical world battle? On the left side of the screen, I want you to notice, as you look at the map, you have oil from the Mideast traveling up what you and I know as the Red Sea and moving through, and this is critical, moving through that narrow passageway into what we know as the Black Sea. Uh, do you wonder why Crimea was such a battle for Russia? They wanted it at all costs? Because they will control world oil. And if you look at Turkey, world oil from the east and from the south to Europe and often to the West, can have a chokehold. Look at verse 16 of Daniel 8, if you will, please. Here's where we begin to see that this is an end-time prophecy. Notice 
Daniel 8. Daniel 8, we read these words in verse 16. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. Now, do you realize there are two people in verse 16? Daniel is not one of them. Notice, you have two angelic beings working together to communicate this message. A man's voice, and he's calling for Gabriel. Why Gabriel? Who told Mary that she was going to have a baby? Gabriel. Gabriel. And in the book of Daniel, Daniel was asking God to explain the 70 weeks to him, or 77s to him, and God sent Gabriel. And for 500 years, he's never seen. He only makes occasional appearances, and they're always to give a clarification of God's message. So, it is important to realize two angels together explain the timing and the truth the idea that this is solely difficult is about to become very difficult for us. Now, I have on the screen behind me, you'll notice all of the nations that surround Israel are moving on Israel. So I'm going to give you some names. We had the king from the east, from Persia, and that king is moving to the west, to the south, to the north. You also have the king of the north, if you'll remember in the book of Daniel. Who is the king of the north? If you look at the map, the largest kingdom today, north of Israel, is Turkey. If you look to the south of Israel, the largest kingdom south of Israel is Egypt. During the period that we have entered, there is a struggle for power going on in the Mideast. That struggle for power is between Turkey, Iran, and Egypt must partner with Saudi Arabia with either or both of them. I would remind you in the book of Genesis chapter 10, after the worldwide flood, the Bible tells us that the sons of Noah scattered over the face of the earth. Japheth headed north and west. That would be Europe and Russia. Shem headed to the south and to the east, which is all the Asiatic peoples. Ham headed to the Sahara Desert on the map or headed to Africa. And you have worldwide populations that come out of these three family groups. But what unites everything north of Israel is they're all descendants of Japheth. What unites those south are they are descendants of Shem. In the book of Daniel, you are told that the <coughs> kingdom that is coming from the east, I'm sorry, from the west, look at verse 21. It's called in our Bibles, if you'll notice, it's called the kingdom of Greece. But it's actually called the kingdom of J-A-V-A-N. And the kingdom of Javan has a very interesting point on the map. If it's Greece, if you look closely at the map, you will see in the map that Greece is actually to the left of Javan. If you'll remember the famous Battle of Troy, the Battle of Troy took place at Javan. What is Javan? Javan is western Turkey. Why Javan? When Alexander the Great crossed the Aegean Sea and led his forces into Asia Minor, Javan was the capital for the Greek Empire. He began his government there and he ruled all of the Mideast from there. Here's another map just to further help us see that. Javan is not across the Aegean Sea. 
It is actually east of the Aegean Sea. Now, let's look closely at the text and think this through some. So it comes time for Daniel to understand. So Gabriel came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face, but he said to me, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to what? Look at the text. The time of the end. It doesn't refer to history. It refers to the end times. All that took place in history is a foreshadowing of the end times. But this prophecy is really an end time prophecy. <clears throat> now again, you remember last week I made this statement. The focus of prophecy is always, notice the map, it's Mideast. It's from Greece to northern Africa, eastward to what you and I know as Iran, and then southeastward, Saudi Arabia. This is the total focus. So, I want you to look again at Daniel chapter 8, and I'm about to put this together if you just be patient. Daniel 8, notice verse 19. And Gabriel said, Look, I am making known to you what shall happen. Listen carefully. In the latter time of the indignation. Wait a minute. What is the time of the indignation? It's the ultimate end of the persecution of Israel, and it is what you and I have come to call the tribulation. Listen carefully. For at the appointed time, the end shall be. It's not about a beginning. It is about an ultimate end. So what is this passage describing? Look at the map. And the kingdom of Javan, or Alexander's kingdom, included <clears throat> Greece. It went northward into Macedonia and affected what you and I have come to know as the Balkan countries. And then, look, if you will, on the map and what ruled from Asia Minor. Notice you have the Ottoman Empire. Do any of you know anything about the Ottoman Empire? I've heard of it, but I couldn't tell you what it was all about. It was a Persian, it was a Muslim empire. And the Ottoman Empire actually came all the way to Vienna, Austria. And the furthest they ever got to Vienna, Austria, was they came to the gates of Vienna and they sieged the city of Vienna. They did not defeat it. And do you know that the date that they actually retreated in 16, I think it was 1683, do you know the date they retreated? It is September the 11th. Oh, wow. Coincidence? No. According to the Muslims, they were picking up their commitment to take over the West. That's why they chose September 11th. It wasn't just an incident. It didn't just happen that day. It was picked far in advance that this is the day we will begin our march on the West. Look at this map. This is the Muslim world today. It is very difficult for me to believe anyone can actually interpret Bible prophecy and take one-third of the world's population and believe they don't exist. It's not Christian versus non-Christian only. It's not Jew versus Gentile only. But 2.3 billion, with a B, people are Muslim. Whatever your view of prophecy, those people are affected by it. How are they affected? Well, what you have in front of you is you have a map of the Muslim world, but I don't know if you realize that there are two kinds of Muslims. All Muslims claim to be followers of Muhammad. But when <coughs> Muhammad died, there was a battle for who would be his uh, heir. And the battle was actually a question of, do we choose his daughter or do we choose someone that we think is of the caliber to lead us? And so what they wanted was 
heavenly right, the right of kings, versus someone qualified. Islam began to divide at that point, and Islam divided into two different groups. The two different groups believe mostly the same about everything, except the ultimate empire. How is it going to be led? All through history, you have heard the term the Mahdi, the Mahdi, the Mahdi. The term Mahdi is Messiah in Islam. We have a Messiah. They have a Messiah. Israel had a Messiah. Their Messiah, when you look at who he is and what he is, fits the exact description of our Antichrist. I've done a study on this. I'm not going to present it now. I'm just telling you, if you took a coin and you looked at Antichrist on one side and the Mahdi on the other, it would be like the Lincoln penny, his head on one side and the Lincoln Memorial on the other. But the difference in the two is this. One group said there must be a religious leader, and the religious leader will appoint the civil leader. Those are known as Shiite Muslims. The other group said, we will have spiritual leaders, but we will keep the political leader separate. They are known as Sunni Muslims. And very interestingly, the primary location for the power of the Shiites, if you look at the map closely, it is Iran. The head of the Shia Sunni Muslims, very interestingly, is Turkey. Iran actually became Iran in 1932 and was Persia. Turkey was Javan, was Greece, where Alexander led his government when he came into Asia Minor, and Turkey is the center for Sunni Muslims. Look again at this map. I've simply colored it different. I, I say I've colored it different. It's a different map. I didn't color it at all. Tom, so <coughs> you said that when Muhammad died, is that, that they were divided between who should lead. And you said one was his daughter. His daughter and a spiritual leader. And which or a political it? leader. Shiite, Sunni. The divide started then. Okay. It's all about what kind of world government. Because Muslims believe they're to conquer the world. Do you realize that Muhammad fought 33 battles in his lifetime? 33 different attempts to conquest. That's the only way that Muslims have ever taken over. It's never been by conversion. That's not their approach. It's conquest. Because they believe in conquest. Which I believe now brings us to what we really need to understand. We are seeing and have been seeing, I am convinced, the Shiite-Sunni war. The battle that you are seeing in the Mideast right now is Shiites versus Sunnis. Let me develop this. When you look at prophecy, and you'll notice this is a Time Magazine cover that you have before you. And Time Magazine actually asked the question, why they hate each other? And they do. You ever notice there's a struggle between Saudi Arabia and Iran, between Egypt and Iran, between Turkey and Iran? The reason is because how they believe the government is put together. Iran, what do we know? The Ayatollahs con control. Uh, Iran, because they have spiritual leaders. What do you have in Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey? All of them have a civil government that is not under religious control. They may travel beside each other. And there may be extremes even in their group, like there are among the Shiites. But the biggest move to take control of everything comes from the Shiites today. Looking at They're this the map. minority, aren't they? Hmm? Aren't the Sunni, isn't the Sunni population, it's bigger, right? I'm about to show you that. Oh. 
Yes, the answer is yes. The Sunni population is bigger. When you look at Bible prophecy and attempt to ask the question, how did we get where we are in the present political scene, there are two important benchmarks. 1948, Israel becomes a nation. We all know that that's when we actually had the, what we would call Arab world back then, to turn on the nation of Israel. And the Palestinian problem did not begin with Israel. The Palestinian problem came because five countries around Israel told their own Arabic and Turk people, if you will leave, when we get the country, we'll bring you back. Once they didn't win the war, they abandoned their own people because they realized if we leave them hanging, it will become, in essence, the albatross around the neck of Israel. And it is to this day. It's all part of this master plan to ultimately destroy Israel. If this is an end time vision, then what I'm saying is you have two Islamic wars that will take place that bring us to the scene for Daniel 9, the 70 weeks to begin. What is that vision of? All right, the question that you just asked, um, Patty, I can remember your name. <laughs> Forgive me, I'm sorry, I drew a blank. It's okay, I do notice, it all the time. Notice the map. What you have in this turquoise color or bluish color, you know, it's full turquoise, uh, is Shiite Muslims. That's their geographical territory on this map. What you have in the rust or red color is the Sunni Muslims. Which is larger? Sunnis. By far. Which is more determined? Shiites right now. <laughs> wow. Why? That's exactly what the text says. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor were there any that could deliver from his hands, but he did it according to his will and became great. Stay with me a minute. The first move toward world conquest comes from Persia or Iran. And in their struggle, if you'll notice, they moved west into Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. Right now, Israel has been fighting Hamas.